So this is the Jermaine Greer panel. Um, my name's Katie Bird. I'm the University of New South Wales archivist. And behind me I have um, four of my colleagues from the University of Melbourne um, who have been involved with the Jermaine Greer collection. Um, so I've got um, Dr. Rachel Buchanan, who's the curator, curator of the Jermaine Greer archive. Um, and she's going to talk about the um, aspects of the Ethiopia and the Greer archive. And I've got um, Kate Hodgetts. Um, so Kate is an artist and an archivist. And she spent many hours listening to and uh, creating time-coded summaries for the audio series and has recently completed work on the photographic series. Um, so she'll be talking about audio, ambience and money. And um, Sarah Brown on my, my left here. So she's an archivist and a librarian. And um, Sarah joined the Greer team to catalog the archives of Dr. Greer's major published works. Um, so she'll be talking about books as archival objects. And um, Lachlan Glanville is assistant archivist on the Jermaine Greer archive. And um, he'll be discussing the um, TV series and absence. Um, so I'll just pass it on to Rachel. Welcome everyone, thank you for coming. <clears throat> Topics of conversation in the office, found document, personal work folder. Cervical caps and IUDs, <clears throat> female ejaculation, I can send you a sample. Violence against children, Peggy's fist. Greer's dad's overcoat, her own coat. Cunts, cock socks, bra burning, guinea pigs knives. Pornography. Rape, is the penis more serious than the fist? GBH versus rape. Driving, habits of dogs, names of pets, types of orgasm, vaginal versus clitoral. Welcome to the receipt and processing at the peak of the work on the Jermaine Greer archive. These were some of the topics shared between the four Greer archivists here today and our colleague Millie Weber and other colleagues at UMA who happened to drop by and eavesdrop in on the insanity. This chatter is part of what I call ambient knowledge about the Greer archive. Ambient knowledge is a phrase that draws on ideas about ambient intelligence and ambient intimacy that are common in computer and social sciences research, but it also draws on dictionary definitions of ambience as an atmosphere, mood, feel, flavour, something that encompasses, enfolds and surrounds. Uh, so this is a really, really beautiful image that um, you, can, you can look at this and 560 other um, unprocessed negatives that we've now processed. So this was taken by an unknown Ethiopian person in Ethiopia in 1985. Jermaine Greer was there as a reporter for the Observer newspaper and it never ran her copy, all her photographs, but we have processed them now. So um, just Jermaine's just watching over this little bit of the talk. Ambient knowledge is contextual knowledge held within the Greer team, but outside of the finding aids. This knowledge about the connections between records across disparate series, about pet names for lovers or indeed for actual pets, and about events or people that have evidently been important to the creator of the archive but are not yet in the public domain is ambient knowledge. Ambient knowledge is the information in our conversations. It's the knowledge that fuels our jokes. It's the questions we ask each other and our memories of private conversations we've had with Professor Greer, either face to face or via email and our memories of our conversations with researchers, donors, and former colleagues. This knowledge is valuable but diffuse. It's ephemeral and easily lost when an archivist leaves, for example. Whispers, asides, throwaway remarks. We've listened well to these records, and today we'll share some of this ambient knowledge with you. So let's welcome Lachlan. Germaine Greer is a list maker. Throughout the Greer archive, we find examples of these jotted on the reverse of printed emails and letters, shopping lists, family trees for uh, 16th century poets. The Greer Archive itself is a series of lists. The television series is a list of programs she's appeared on. The Women Artists series is a list of women artists from antiquity to contemporary practice, with files relating to over 4,000 individual artists. She even began work in the 70s on a women's book of lists, a pot boiler, including lists of best-selling pantyhose and current bride prices. This is a list of things that Greer would like destroyed for all time. <laughs> Compiled for the British TV show Room 101. Archivists trade in lists too, box lists and finding aids. So why do we make lists? To help us find things? To help us remember things? List making is an active process. 
The television series contains 665 files relating to as many television appearances over her 50 plus year career. Most of these contain documentation, uh, emails relating to the arrangement and um, administration of performances. However, a significant portion, mostly relating to early appearances in the 60s, relate to attempts to source recordings of these television programs some 40 odd years after the programs initially aired. Greer went as far as to employ an assistant specifically tasked with hounding production companies for copies of these programs. Despite this, many early programs such as Good Old Knocker, Twice a Fortnight, and the majority of Nice Time episodes were unable to be sourced. The reasons for this are well enough known. In the 60s and 70s, television was still considered an ephemeral medium. Trace tapes were expensive and were often wiped and reused. In the UK, the British Film Institute, while it began acquiring recordings of news broadcasts in 1960, only seriously began collecting television broadcasts after it was clear that vast amounts of television history had already been lost. The 97 episodes of Doctor Who from the 60s are a well-known example of this. We know many of Greer's earliest television programs through the documentation found in the Television and Early Years series. In 1973, Greer presented a series of four discussion programs for Channel 10 titled Courtship and Marriage in Australia, um, Australian Sexual Morality, subtitled The Randy Puritans, Women at Work and the Australian Family. The series brought together audiences from across the social and political spectrum who will not be experts or analysts of other people's behaviour. They will be demonstrating, criticising and defending their own lifestyles and experience. The file contains lists of topics for discussion and desired audience members. For the program Australian Sexual Morality, these included prostitutes, male and female, a sex offender, a sexual athlete, school kids from a notorious school, and an assortment of people who think their sex life is normal. Rupert Murdoch is also on the list, but crossed out. <laughs> a Google search returns no record of these programs at all, no press reviews or clips. National Film or Sound Archive has no record of them. Searching trove for television listings from the time doesn't even tell us the title that the programs were aired under. We assume they were aired because Greer tried to find copies of them around 2010. We know that the sketch comedy series Nice Time was aired in 1968 and 1969. However, we currently know of only two episodes that have survived of the 29 aired, one on VHS in the Greer Archive and one that surfaced on YouTube. There is also a never aired short black and white outtake of Germaine Greer greeting Kenny Everett as a milkman from the bath of milk found on 16 mil film in the Greer Archive. had to wait for the cat. While there is little surviving video footage of these programs, the textual material that does exist is extremely rich. This includes another list of sketch ideas this time. Personal favourites are a competition for wives to find who can make the best job of de decorating their husband's bald head with paint, modelling clay, and three well-known comedians allowed one minute each to try and make a team of undertakers laugh. But what is this impulse to return to the 60s and 70s to try and complete the record? We see this all through the Greer Archive in photocopies of student articles in the print journalism series, which were made long after they were originally published. Now, at an event earlier this year about the Greer Archive, Greer said she didn't create the archive, she just kept it. This may have been true in the heady days of the female eunuch when she was receiving hundreds of letters a day from people all over the world. However, in the years since, its accumulation has clearly been an active process which has been undertaken with attempt, with intent. 
It's worth noting here that what is attempted to complete is her work in the public domain. Very little material exists in the archive from the 60s and earlier prior to her years at Cambridge. While her record keeping may at first appear to be completionist and a little obsessive, there's also something oddly self-effacing about it. Over and over again, we see examples of attempts to shift the focus from Greer the writer to the social um, strata in which she um, existed. So if record keeping is a kind of witnessing, as Sue McKemish put it in her 96 paper, Evidence of Me, what is Greer calling on us to witness here in the archive? The justification Greer returns to often when asked about the archive is what McKemish identifies as bearing witness to the cultural moment. An inventory from the creator by 90, from 97 gives us one of the archive's potential uses, useful not only as a guide to feminist thought, but because of the 20,000 letters from the general public to the evolution of social attitudes in the latter half of the century. It's also in this mode that Greer's television career is often cast as a talking head on documentary programs about the 60s and 70s, commenting on feminism, pornography, figures like the Monty Python crew and Lillian Roxon. Even Nice Time, which at first glance traded in nonsense and the absurd, was in its own way deeply political as a direct response to the grimness of the social climate in the late 60s. Germain recollects a sketch where they paid a man on the street five pound to climb a lamppost. The flip side of that sketch was the man was a tradesman who'd pawned his tools for booze and could therefore no longer work. It's particularly powerful in the original documentation of the programs in the 60s and 70s where the final products are inaccessible, are inaccessible or have not survived, where we don't have recorded the thoughts of notorious school children regarding sex on film. Here we get valuable insights into television production and creative processes such as the audience and sketch list mentioned earlier. However, there is also an element of self-justification here. Um, in files for later programs such as Newsnight, where Greer's harried assistant Carol emails production companies requesting VHS tapes of the preceding night, as we are getting mail and we need to check what was said, at the Germain Greer Ar Meets the Archivist event in March this year, Greer spoke about her return to Australia in the early 70s, and the stories about her past that were aired and bore no relation to Greer's memory of them. Um, at the time, she remembers her response being, what, you know, this can't go on, this falsification of real events cannot go on. What can I do about it, were her exact words. And now we know what she did about it. The archive is set up as a windbreak against the public idea of Germaine Greer, the mythical beast, as she puts it. Greer's archival instinct is often methodical, one fold of her television program containing itineraries, admin, correspondence, and any other paperwork associated with the making of the program. The mail in response to television programs is stored elsewhere in the general correspondence series. It's where we find deviations from this approach that are most revealing. For a panel talk show series, The Last Word, viewer responses are stored with the documentation, giving a range of women's opinions on adultery, homeschooling, and care for the aged. We see instances of this in other series as well, in the hundreds of vicious emails she received for her column on Steve Irwin, filed with the printout of the column itself in the print journalism series, and viewer responses for the two guest-hosted Dick Cavett program shows on rape and abortion in the early years series. These are instances where we have the object and the response filed side by side. They're places where Greer is subtly directing us to look. Um, we also find instances where empty folders have been filed with titles like Sydney Cities 1979, which was the name of the documentary, and they have no documents, they are empty. Um, this is where she's saying things should be here, but they are not. And so I think in Greer's mind, there is a, an ideal archive, like a single place of truth, which the physical archive, the archive that's in our repository in Brunswick, is never able to actually measure against. It has its own ideas. Um, so Vern Harris, in his response to Sue McKemish's paper, um, went with a, a pippy little quote saying that, evidence must always be mourned for its preservation carries the very possibility of its reduction to ashes, 
this is the tension we find in the Greer Archive. Working on the Jermaine Greer Archive since July last year, I've had the opportunity to catalogue a diverse range of materials. Originally employed to work on the audio series, I created time-coded summaries for each audio recording. The collection had already been digitised from their original carriers, <coughs> cassettes, mini-discs and digital audio tapes. And out of the 295 resulting MP3s, I have listened to 284. Greer's Italian language recordings were time-coded by archivist Sebastian Gocillo. And as I summarised, I listened to every single second. <clears throat> Next, I moved on to Greer's photographs. Again, this was not a straightforward cataloguing experience or quick win, as all of the photographs and negatives and slides required rehousing, every single one, and there are thousands. Working through these two series, not much escaped to my eyes or ears. I've now moved on to Greer's correspondence with radio stations, and the knowledge that I have acquired from photographs and audio has come with me. As archivists, we have an almost forensic experience with collection materials. Unlike researchers who can jump from one collection to another, listen to one audio recording out of 295, look at only photographs of family and ignore everything else, we as archivists begin at the beginning and end at the end, and like a crime scene line search, we turn over every leaf. Because of this, we gain a more holistic understanding of a collection. Through our metadata entries, discussions, publications, and events like this, some of our discoveries and connections, independently and as the Greer team, can be documented, but not all. And eventually, a, what, a, a lot of what is ephemeral will simply fade away. As a preventive measure, and because it's our job, we have developed really detailed finding aids with keywords that are consistent throughout the entire archive. In addition to the standard finding aid, each audio recording has its own time-coded summary. These allow researchers to skip to sections considered relevant to their research and avoid others. While the summaries are in no way a replacement for the experience of listening to the audio, it is undeniable that they save, a research, they save researchers a great deal of time. As audio is a temporal medium, I could not skim over the surface. I had to listen to every second, every breath. And often, I would need to listen again, some sections several times, to understand what it was that I was listening to. Contextual information sometimes come, came later, from hard evidence found elsewhere in the archive, or from the more anecdotal memories of the donor herself. At the recent event in March to open the archive, Greer insisted that the collection was not about her, stating, you will be puzzled in my absence from it. Then referring to the audio, she added, there are other things where I am all too present. Greer went on to discuss a personal recording of herself in Ethiopia, describing it as, quote, a meditation on the Ethiopian famine, which was actually recorded while I was lying on a mortuary slab. Most people never made it to the mortuary because they died so fast they went straight into the ground, end quote. I had time-coded this very recording as part of my work on the audio series. I'd listened to every second of it while staring intensely at the floor beside my desk. I hung on every word as Greer whispered into the recorder what she had seen and experienced at the resettlement camp. Prior to meeting Greer, I had no knowledge that this entry was recorded while lying on a mortuary slab. I had presumed that she was in a tent or in a room with others, and that her hushed tone was in consideration of her companions. In fact, Greer was so quiet that the loudest sound was the clicking of the tape going through the machine. Click, 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 like a clock, a reminder of our own mortality. Being the only person at UMA to have heard the recording, majority of these recordings, all I had was the sound as it unfolded and whatever could be conveyed from the original carrier. Like with this one, Thistle Bird Feeder. All I had was the title and the audio. 
So I'd get to work, sit at my desk, put my headphones on, load up the digitised audio, and this is what I would hear. What the scene is on this thing? Oh, have I got it on voice activated? Let's first of all see that. Video. On. But now it's activated, I don't know. Bugger it, really. Now then. £11.99, 80p a kilo, with this mixture of seeds by Gardman, which seems to me to be... What does it say here? I'll tell you what's in it. Except it says it's not fit for human consumption. It doesn't say what's in it. It's marketed by the British Trust for Ornithology. I can see black sunflower seed. I can see oats. Can, can't they tell me what's in it? This is one of the more bizarre recordings in the audio series. And it took me quite a while to understand what was going on. Basically, it appears that Greer had left her recorder on voice activated while visiting a shopping shopping center. Hmm. As you can see in this summary, most of the audio is background noise. At nine minutes, Greer reveals that she's looking to buy a thistle seed bird feeder. Hence the title, Thistle Seed Feeder. These recordings can be very unpredictable and often reveal themselves slowly. Once I completed the audio, I moved on to photographs. With the audio series behind me, I was able to put, put faces to some of the names discussed, sometimes even voices. At the opening, oh, at the opening event, Greer stated that there were no personal photographs in the archive. She also stated that there was not a lot of gush about her animals. Greer had either never noticed their presence or she had since forgotten. In the 1990s, Greer consciously began recording her audio diaries. In one of the early recordings, Greer explains. Audio diary. This is an attempt to keep track of my days by recording something about the, my past doings as I walk the dogs. In case you can hear panting in the background, it's a flying dog occasionally passing. In actuality, many of the recordings are observations of Greer's immediate surroundings, including her experience with her dogs, their eating habits, their toilet habits, as she walked them, two black poodles, Molly and Margot, through the English countryside. And it's not just the dogs. There are endless stories of cats, geese, hares, muntjacks, her parrot birdie, and pheasants throughout both the audio and photographs series. Whoops, yeah. The photography series contains separate files for each cat, often chronicling their lives from kitten to fully grown. And I know from discussions with my colleagues that the animals have burrowed themselves into various other pockets of the archive. Having completed the audio series, which as well as Greer's personal diaries, included professional recorded and produced audio, it was logical for me to go on to catalogue a series detailing her radio appearances. As mentioned previously, the audio series did not come with a lot of contextual information. On this cassette profile, Jermaine Greer on Elizabeth Jennings. Greer visits poet Elizabeth Jennings in her North Oxford flat. Greer interviews Jennings. The two discuss poetry and people discuss their experiences of Jennings and poems are read. The recording has gone through heavy post-production and includes sound effects such as the start of a car engine and the atmospheric sounds of a bustling cafe. Here is a sample from the intro. to Oxford to meet Elizabeth Jennings, who happens to be my favourite living poet. I'm wondering if she can possibly be the kind of scatty bag lady that some interviewers have made her out to be, or indeed a 
destitute and neglected as others have made her seem. In any other country, a person who'd published 27 volumes of distinguished verse, and about as many works again of other kinds, would have been heaped with honours. This week, I came across the corresponding file in the radio series. Looking at this file and how it related to the audio opened up my eyes not only to the contextual information around the recording, but also the processes involved in producing a radio program, from first correspondence with Greer to the editing of the audio and the delivery of the cassette, the smoke and mirrors. When, oh, another audio recording that I very much enjoyed was a five-part series recorded in 1997 titled What is Culture? In the series, Greer discusses the use of the word culture and its meaning and uses in society. She discusses, dif she discusses differences between arts and crafts, high and low culture, books and texts, and questions art education and public funding for the arts. Here is a recording of Greer recording the promo from the series. Art is not what it used to be. Books are on the blink and may soon be a thing of the past. Kids know more about video games than they do about the kings of England. Football has driven out cricket. Is this the end of civilization as we know it? Civilization as we know it is always ending. It's always civilization as we knew it. Respect for the past, though, shouldn't be fear of the future. What is best in our culture will survive. Why do I think this? In my series, What is Culture? I try to explain. When researching this audio, I couldn't find any information on the series. The recording in the archive is uncut and basically a straight copy of how it, how it was recorded. There are, discussion, yep, there are discussions between Greer and the audio technician, and Greer returns to sections for another take. I was very curious to hear the public, published version with the addition of the usual bells and whistles. Having now seen the file relating to these recordings in the radio series, I've discovered that the broadcast of this recording was never meant to be. Sitting alongside Greer's script in the file are several back and forths with producer John Bickley. The program was turned down by both the BBC World Service and Radio 3, the reason being that the script was too complex with too many unexplained references. Asked to rewrite it, Greer declined. As archivists, we share what we can of the knowledge that we gain and the connections that are made when we get the opportunity. But anyone who has ever written a scope note, an essay, or even a book will know that not all of the information we have can be conveyed, and eventually some of it disappears from memory. If the creator of the archive, Jermaine Greer, believes that there is not a lot of gush about the animals in the archive, perhaps one day we will too. In the meantime, we'll continue with the time that we have working on this incredible collection to capture as much of the ambient knowledge as we can, both independently and collaboratively as the Greer team. Thank you. Uh, here's Germaine Greer in her office at the Mills, her house at Stump Cross, Essex. You can see the environment of a consummate researcher. She's surrounded by her filing cabinets and her books, and some of these I recognise as now at UMA. This lovely photograph is one of a sequence of images that were taken in 2014 to document the Greer archive in situ, prior to it being packed by Dr. Katrina Dean and Jock Murphy for transport to Australia. I expect I'm not the only archivist who's worked with collections where books are either not initially selected for inclusion in an archive or where discretionary disposal of publications and printed material is an option on the basis that copies are readily available in library collections, newspaper articles can be sourced online, they're not obviously relevant. The purely functional appraisal of publications based on criteria such as their uniqueness and availability and even monetary value is more problematical in personal papers collections. Layers of meaning and personal significance not relevant to business or organisational archives come into play. And books may have been retained as evidence of me, personal history, for sentiment, or for reasons which may become clear only as the archive is explored. Perhaps some of us have been there ourselves as we cull our own library shelves and look at books important, at least at one time, to us or family members, experiencing firsthand the poignancy of almost seeing the person within a book 
at the at associations and memories a Commodore Garden volume can evoke. But logistically, most institutions can't take it all, in analogue form at least, and hard appraisal and selection decisions preferencing primary source material often have to be made. In the Greer archive, um, we've all concluded that both published and unpublished material are intrinsic to her archive, as it, as it contains the life of a writer, an academic, a public intellectual, lover of Italy, music and pets, and really a general polymath. Um, the many record types and material formats in the Greer Archive include two discrete collections of books, which will be my focus of my discussion. There's also an extremely interesting collection of ephemeral publications, which, given the theme of the conference, um, is, it would have been a good one to explore, but um, time was against me. Um, I first began to understand the ex extent of the published material in the archive as I listed my first Greer series, major works last year, the series relating to Greer's writing of her books. What I found, in addition to the expected iterations of drafts and manuscripts, was evidence of Greer as a diligent researcher and a constant library user. Um, this is just a, a really gorgeous collage of some of her library cards, which being Greer, she's actually kept. Um, Many folders in this series have comprised voluminous bundles of research material of all ty types, um, scholarly and um, popular. Um, and as my colleagues have discussed, we've actually had the opportunity to list in a lot more detail than in um, what's common in the more progress, sort of less process environment. And as I got to the end of this series, I could see I'd also listed a mini archive of research uh, which is also found in other series in the Greer Archive, as Lachlan said, particularly the Women and Artists series. So the two book series comprise 124 volumes, which came with the major accession of the archive, as selected by Katrina in Essex, and an additional 41 volumes and one magazine sent by Greer in 2016, the latter in a crate accompanying correspondence files. The books in this later accession were described by Greer as being sent to use up the space. A casual reference, which actually belied that Greer, the conscious archivist, had retained these books, taken them from her shelves, and had them sent to join her archive in response to correspondence with um, Rachel, the, Gu the Greer curator. Rachel had contacted Germaine in early 2016 about uh, Greer's research sources for the female eunuch writing that she was trying to unpick how you blended multiple sources, provocations and inspirations into one manuscript and at such speed. To which Greer replied, the best way to proceed is probably working back from the footnotes of the published versions of the female eunuch and advising that she had her own copies of the books she'd referred to in TFE, as she calls it, and these are still in my possession and offering to send them to the archives, which of course we accepted. We had some interesting discussions at UMA on how best to process these two collections of books. Yes, the books are individual volumes which could be catalogued using library standards by the Bailey Library and included in their catalogue. One advantage could be that the books would be found via a library search um, and gaining a potentially wider audience than is perhaps possible with the current UMA collection management platform. But by virtue of their inclusion in the Greer archive, are they, more importantly, archival records in which provenance, context and connections with other items and series in the Greer Archive is vital information to capture? And could such metadata be easily incorporated into Bare Bones Library Catalogue? Preliminary assess assessments of the boxes received in both of these accessions um, confirmed that the collections were actually created for different purposes, albeit with some anom anomalies. The 2014 transfer contains 24 books authored or edited by Greer and 84 books containing contributions by her, sort of articles or introductions, etc. Most of these are interleaved with a thin strip of paper marking Greer's entry, confirming their archival status as part of the Greer oeuvre and also Greer's conscious construction of the archive of her work. 
and 27 volumes also contained marginalia, annotations, underlinings, and the like. These books, however, also contained a small selection of books about or mentioning Greer and her milieu. And just to show you a few, there's um, her Paul Defoe's memoir. Paul Defoe was her husband for a very short time. Um, and Richard Neville's Hippie Hippie Shake on uh, 1960s London and the Oz Trial. Um, Christine Wallace's unauthorised biography of Greer, Untamed Shrew, seems a notable absence, um, as Greer had included uh, David Plant's Difficult Women, which I believe is a book she also dislikes. Um, I also found um, a book by um, a lady called Anne Kun Eliasson, a novel called Any Four Women Could Rob the Bank of England. Um, published in 1983, this is a, a humorous crime caper which features a character, expatriate Hermione Hendrix, bona fide celebrity, author of Put That In Your Jockstrap, dot, dot, dot. Guess who? We know from the general correspondence series that Anne was a friend and neighbour of Greer's in Tuscany in the 1970s, and she's also acknowledged as a source of Greer's rather excellent recipe um, for spaghetti alla cecca, spaghetti alla cecca, published in the University of Tulsa's Erudite Professor's Cookbook, which also was in this collection. And that's a light-hearted item from Greer's time as the often beleaguered founder director of the University of Tulsa Centre for the Study of Women's Lit Literature. Um, so for this series, we allocated the sort of rather lengthy title, Publications by, Contributed to, or About Greer. In the 2006 later accession, um, annotations, marginalia, and interleavings in most of the items indicated that these books were actively used by Greer for reference and research purposes. These books had, in fact, in fact arrived with Greer interventions in the form of specific contextual information. Many of the, Greer, the books containing yellow sticky notes annotated with what they were used for or meant to her. Greer's comments and perusal of the female eunuch footnotes confirmed that many of the books sent were indeed significant to her in researching and writing the female eunuch. And these are um, some of the books that came and you can see that they're her well-thumbed copies of some of the talismatic books of the 1960s. Um, just, uh, I'll just draw your attention to the note on Shulamith Firestone's Dialectic of Sex, which reads, this is a proof copy of an important influence on GG, not now easy to find. The 2016 accession also contains volumes of poetry by women poets, speaking to Greer's scholarship and establishment of Stump Cross Books, her own imprint, which published the work of forgotten women poets. And... Um, this is, um, an this is one of Greer's textbooks from the University of Melbourne of uh, Robert Frost's poetry, complete with doodles, and it's one of the few survivors from her time at the University of Melbourne. So uh, we called this series Annotated Reference Publications. And after our extended discussion, we actually decided we would catalogue both these series in the archival series listing format we were using for the rest of the Greer archive. To easily upload to the current UMA collection management platform, but to include item description elements that could enable a crosswalk to library catalogues in the future, uh, mainly via using the AS ISBN. Um, Dr. Natasha's story from the Beilu Library um, should be acknowledged because she helped us translate our decisions into practice and worked on both series. Um, just uh, this is just a few the first few records from the annotated series, reference series publications. And you can see it contains basic bibliographic metadata, document type, author date, etc. Um, and we also included um, consistent subject headings based on OCLC WorldCat. And we also combined that with a um, subject headings we were using for an in-house thesaurus we have developed, which is based on Library of Congress headings. Uh, but the more important elements are the inscriptions, interleaved letters, sticky notes, and additional metadata accompanying these books. 
which really link us to the personal and social significance of Greer's work and also the impact of her celebrity. Um, I've just highlighted a couple. This is um, a letter written to Greer by poet Fran Landsman, which is a very sort of poignant uh, reflection on her reading of the female eunuch where she says, it's too late for me, I wonder how I would have been. Another one is Sue Kedgley, um, who wrote to Greer about Greer's infamous New Zealand visit in 1972, when she also toured Australia. Uh, Greer was actually arrested in Auckland on obscene language charges for saying bullshit and fuck. And uh, Kedgley discusses the, the impact of this visit on the New Zealand public. And um, Greer's annotation, uh, Greer the archivist again, notes that uh, additional archival material relating to this is in New Zealand. So just returning to the larger series, uh, which I worked on, um, this final image just really gives an idea of the range and diversity of Greer's contributions. And I really enjoyed um, looking at some of these books as, as I added the, the records. Um, We've talked about the sort of interconnections between series. I've moved on to looking at the speaking series, which some like, like, somewhat like the TV series is a series of administrative range, arrangements because Greer um, very rarely, or she speaks off the cuff. You know, she's a very good um, extempore speaker. And there's really a transcript or typescript of her speeches. And she also doesn't like being recorded. Um, but I can now make connections back to some of the books um, as the published outcomes of um, in the main sort of academic conference papers. So just to conclude, my work on the books in the Greer archive has really highlighted to me that a book is often more than a book. Their value to archival collections is determined by the creator of the archive, but it's also strongly developed by the archivists from those who initially appraise and select and the ones like us who go on to process. Uh, we've made these volumes discoverable via basic bibliographic catalog cataloging, but much of the value to future research is, is undoubtedly in the additional metadata, documenting their context, Greer's contributions, their importance to her, and our inclusion of pointers to um, marginalia and annotations, and how her books link to other I series and items within the archive. We've taken our cues and clues from the creator of the archive. Um, sometimes it's been clear direction and sometimes it's just been breadcrumb trails which we've followed to aha moments of connections and meaning. And as my colleagues have discussed, um, these have been drawn from our ambient knowledge of the archive, which as we've also discussed is fragile and transitory. Our approach throughout this project has been deliberately non-interventionist respectful of provenance and original order, and the relationship of the creator to her archive. Uh, our overlay of metadata, both as supplied by Greer and discovered by us, I think confirms the place of books in the Greer archive, at least as unequivocally archival objects. so it doesn't crackle. Um, I think you'll agree it's a very talented group of archivists that I'm working with and it's been a really wonderful experience to work alongside um, this group of people. Um, so I'm just going to uh, talk about the Ethiopia Digitization Project and I invite you all to go to the University of Melbourne Archives catalogue and type in Ethiopia to the search digitised records. We just published a lot of records yesterday. Um, so Jermaine Greer went to Ethiopia in late 1984 and twice in 1985 to report on a famine, first for the Mail on Sunday, then for the Observer, and then to make a TV documentary for diverse productions. Ethiopia infects the Greer archive. Records from these trips have defied Greer's attempts at arrangement. Ethiopia records can be found in most series of the archive and they often feel out of place. Ethiopia refuses to be classified. This map is in the early years series, it's hand annotated and you can, it's, it's there filed, Greer's filed it next to an invitation to a party at Warwick Castle in 1968 and the next folder contains poems written on University of Melbourne Crested paper in 1959. Her Ethiopia reporter's notebooks are slipped into the major work series next to typescript drafts of Kissing the Rod 
an anthology of 16th, 17th century women's verse that Greer co-edited and drafted a document publicity tours for Sex and Destiny, her 1984 book on the politics of human fertility. Ethiopia is threaded through the print journalism series as well. I'm just going to show you. Oh, no, there we are. Put that. Um, there's the two-page fragment typescript that Greer has labelled Ethiopia, Journalism Ethiopia 1984, a June 1985 article for the Mail on Sunday, and a thick folder Greer has called The True Story of Ethiopia Resettlement. This fascinating folder ho holds papers relating to Greer's battle with the observer. The paper refused to run her two 5,000-word feature articles on the famine, but Greer insisted and won a kill fee and costs. She has even included a photocopy of the check in the folder, the true story indeed. I often, often get the sense that Greer's speaking back. She's, she's actually creating an archive that tells her version of events. <clears throat> Greer included the unpublished resettlement Ethiopia 1985 in the Mad Woman's Underclothes, Picador's 1986 anthology of her journalism and essays. It's a really outstanding collection of writing. She also republished Ethiopia Between the Lines there too. This article first ran in the Listener magazine. It was a brutal attack on the behaviour of Western nations giving food aid to Ethiopia. It was the final piece in the book. The last line of the book reads, chief among the causes of the next catastrophe in Ethiopia will be loose talk and the kind of journalism based upon it. Greer insisted, ensured that she got the last word, but Ethiopia would not leave her alone. Um, this is a bit... Uh, probably can't see it very well. This is a fascinating letter by a guy called Brian Stewart, who was the first foreign TV correspondent to go into Ethiopia. You can watch his report, uh, which is, I think it's called Unveiling the Ethiopian Famine, on the CBC archives online. And I actually watched it two weeks ago, and I recall watching that as a teenager, and it's lost none of its power. So this is a fan letter that Brian Stewart wrote to Jermaine Greer about her work in Ethiopia. Yes, Ethiopia niggled, insisted, rose up. Ethiopia snuck into an article Greer wrote on Maggie Thatcher. The famine penetrated an essay on sex and food for the Daily Telegraph in a speech on the same theme. Ethiopia made its way into columns on ageing, on coffee, on censorship, on Princess Di. When feminist publishing house Virago asked Greer to contribute to an edited anthology on food, she wrote about injera bread, the Ethiopian staple, a sour, spongy bread made from teff, teff a gluten-free grain that Ethiopians use to mop up food. Hunger is the best source until, until it turns into starvation, Greer wrote in that essay. Starving people have no appetite at all. Hunger is healthy. I've met Greer twice at the University of Melbourne Archives our repository in Brunswick, and Ethiopia has come up on each occasion. The bananas she fed to starving people. The problem of getting big sisters to eat. They sacrifice themselves for their younger siblings. The refusal of Western aid agencies and journalists to see how Ethiopians were trying to get themselves out of this disaster and the benefits of the work of the Ethiopian Refugee Resettlement Commission. Ethiopia is a thread of pain that runs through the archives. It is death or brush with death. Ethiopia was failure. The Observer refused to run her articles. And now there's another famine in Africa, even worse. Um, this is, this is uh, published with permission, actually. I've tracked down quite a few of the people that worked with Greer there, and Colin Skinner was the cameraman for Diverse Productions, and he took this photo. <coughs> In Jermaine Greer meets the archivist, as Kate has already said, um, an event that um, I emceed on International Women's Day here. Um, and you can look this event up on YouTube. Uh, it's called Jermaine Greer meets the archivist. And it's very interesting. Greer's giving a lot of comments about arrangement. She's giving us coded directions or direct ones on uh, access management. It's quite fascinating. I haven't actually been able to re-watch that, but uh, I could re-watch it and get more from there. Um, so she returned to Ethiopia in that event. She revealed, as Kate said, that one of the audio recordings in the archive was made on a mortuary slab. So this photo is playing as part of a card, and that's the rest of um, that item. After the public event, Greer spent a few more days at the repository with us, discussing the archive. For several hours, she worked with Kate Hodgett to identify people in photographs or to tell us about the photos and some of the context. We asked her about 36 black and white photos of Ethiopia that were stored in a box with an invoice from Colour Centre London taped to it. They were annotated on the back in a hand I recognised as hers. Who took them? She did, she said. As well as her many other skills and labels, we can now add Jermaine Greer photographer. The Ethiopia Digitisation Project explores the way the famine has spread itself through the archive. It showcases the scope and depth of the archive and demonstrates how interrelated the individual series are. The archive is large, but it is subtle, a perfect hiding place for its creator. 
The crumbs of this very big life are scattered widely. The life itself, like the trip to Ethiopia, often bursts the boundaries of the series that are meant to contain it. The Ethiopia Project exposes the way the archive talks to itself. It, it guides researchers um, by suggesting that you can use Library of Congress subject headings such as famine dash dash Ethiopia to listen into the conversation. Oh, I really like this. This is a um, fax from Carol Horn, uh, one of Greer's, uh, she was a very long serving assistant, worked for Jermaine for 16 years, uh, to Anne Marie Conway at the Weekend Telegraph. And Greer's filing her copy from the Sheraton and Addis Ababa, that's in 2001. And it's just this interesting, it's a fax talking about the copy, but talking about this new pet and all these things mixing together. Um, the records I selected for digitization come from the following series, early years, major works, print journalism, Photographs, television. As the team has catalogued more of the archive, further Ethiopia records have emerged uh, in the speaking series, and notably records relating to Richard Pankhurst, a historiographer of Ethiopia and son of suffragette Sylvia Pankhurst. Sarah knows more about that. It's quite an interesting connection. He helped Greer um, navigate her way through Ethiopia. Ethiopia pops up in contraceptives, cars, and gardens. In between the second and third trips to Ethiopia, Greer bought her property at the mills, Stump Cross, in Essex. In the gardening file, she leaves instruct instructions for the landscaper to follow because she is off to Ethiopia. She was plan planning a bold border for her driveway while she was also writing a script about media representations of the famine. It's one of the hundreds of instances where the complexity of Greer's life, the way the deeply domestic collides with the international geopolitical, made me laugh out loud, and this is another one. So Ron Burt, the smashing pup, you know, being at the Addis Hope, the, the sex not working and so on. So this is one of the, oh, I'll just read one script. And I just want to you know, note that as well as making two trips to Ethiopia in 1985 and buying a country property, uh, Jermaine also went to Cuba and interviewed Vilma Espin, the, uh, a revolutionary, and the sister-in-law of Fidel Castro. And that recording, um, which Kate was time-coding around the time of Castro's death, contains his voice. And Jermaine switches quite easily from English to Spanish and back again and talks about Ethiopia. And after the second trip to Ethiopia, Jermaine went to Turin in Italy to interview Primo Levi. And that recording is in the archive. It's in Italian. It's an extraordinary conversation. I've just read the English translation. But just to give you some context for just how much she was doing in that one year. Uh, and the audio files of these encounters have been digitized, and they're part of the audio series. So any of you uh, could sign an access deed and listen to that audio in the su supervised reading room. Um, and Lachlan, who has um, created an inventory of the third party AV, um, has also listed the, the um, television, the doco that was screened uh, in October 1985, and that will be digitized later this year or early next. So we're going to digitize that whole series of records too. Um, the rest of this talk is just going to be about the most stunning outcome of this digitization project, and that has been the 560 unprocessed negatives, some of the waste generated by Jermaine Greer's print journalism. They're like deleted scenes or offcuts. So this is one of them, the spoils of famine. And Jermaine talked to us about this photograph. Um, so 36 of the 560 were printed uh, and sent to the paper. They didn't want to publish any. And the spoils of famine refers to the jewellery this woman is holding, uh, jewellery taken from the dead. So, um, and you'll note that uh, she's written very carefully her caption, where the photo was taken, and, and the date. She's a very, um, very good record keeper. <coughs> I'm in time to take photographs of my Canon quick flash, I mean my Olympus quick flash in the street, but I'm not at all sure that I get things in focus, actually. <laughs> I mean in frame, I should probably say. But I'm trying. And I'm sure I'm shooting into the light and doing everything else. So, I mean, that's what I was saying about the archive talking to itself. Like, once I'd listened to the audio, I could figure out what was going on in some of these pictures. So, I catalogued the negatives in the out of place, uh, place in the early year series, and also the proof sheets. And after discussions with Kate and our colleagues at UBC, we decided to process these analog negatives. So, this is one of the 560 analog negatives uh, by creating a digital negative of each and a corresponding high res digital print. I created 32 sub items for the 16 rolls of negatives and 15 proof sheets. I listened to the audio files several times, read and reread Greer's unpublished essays, uh, and to piece together what she was actually doing. Um, the digitized reporter's notebooks offer further clues. 
Oh, yeah, so these are really, really beautiful. Um, there's four of them, and she doesn't do shorthand like I know some of us still do, our old, old time newspaper journalists, but um, her notes are really fascinating. So what was happening in these, in these photographs? In short, tens of thousands of starving people were being moved around Ethiopia by an Ethiopian-run agency called the Refugee Resettlement Commission, and Jermaine Greer followed some of these convoys. The commission shifted people from dry places in the north to fertile ones in the south and west. Greer circled a starving nation, but many of her stunning photos show people surrounded by food, women selling mangoes, men milling flour or tending beehives or planting seedlings in a greenhouse. Her journey is tracked on the map you've already seen with a pink highlighter and a biro. When I saw these photographs for the first time, I wept. The famine roared to life on my laptop, and I can't help thinking about what Vern Harris says in The Prisoner in the Garden this morning about archives as a force for sort of social justice and change, and what these images can tell us now about what's happening in Africa now. So this is the first photograph on the first roll of negatives. Greer landed in Addis Ababa on 1 April 1985. There she saw a convoy of 123 settler buses travelling through the city, quote, preceded and followed by motorcycle police on showy BMWs with blue flashing lights and sirens blaring. The convoy was shifting people from Kimbata, about 254 kilometres south of Addis, to Metakal, 400 k's to the north. And sorry um, if my pronunciation is poor, I, I've never been to Ethiopia. Greer had hailed a taxi to Alamgena to watch the convoy. She then hired a Land Rover and drove 700 kilometres over unmade roads to Asosa, a resettlement city on the eastern edge of Ethiopia. 25,000 starving people were arriving there each week. Many of the photos are taken there on the 10th of April. She travelled through Gambella following a convoy driving 570 kilometres inland to Desi. The city was full of famine victims from further north. She then joined a convoy on the move out of Desi, destination unknown. You can follow Greer's route on buses already laced and garlanded with dried vomit in her unpublished essay, and Matt, and the events she narrates against these photographs. She writes, about an hour out of Gouda, we came across a convoy stopped in a muddy bend. The leading bus had swerved to avoid a broken down vehicle and slid into the bank. Settlers relieved themselves or watched as hundreds of hands were pressed against the side of the bus. Under, ule, sos. Unbelievable. Look at the detail you can see in these photographs. So that's one of the things that fascinates me is that the switch from analog to digital means that you can just get all this information that you could never have achieved in the uh, pure analog age. Oops. <coughs> Record this cattle story, but I must say I don't understand it, about a cattle plague from here 20 years ago. And cattle that came here thought the grass died every time the morning afterwards. What this means, I do not know. But apparently cattle are getting used to it, or something. I asked if they were allowing goats, and I was told, yes, goats are particularly suitable for lowland cattle raising. I mean, it's all hopelessly inaccurate, I'm afraid. I'm going to have to rely upon the evidence of my own ears. So I really like that bit of audio, because... Um, one of the themes of the two audio um, diaries and these photographs is Greer's attempt to understand just what she's seeing and trying to sift out what's true and what's not. Um, so after those images you just saw of the bus breaking down, they arrived in a temporary shelter in an airstrip near Nekmeti, um, and then the next day they drove into that, the, into that town, the provincial capital of Walega. Greer's taken beautiful photos of the welcoming committee that um, met them there, and this is one of many of... Um, people embracing starving um, Ethiopians from other parts of the country, people singing, people dancing. Um. Yeah, at, at 8 the next morning, the convoy began to roll through the checkpoint to the sound of rhythmic clapping. When the buses were closer and the citizens could see the pinched and shadowed faces of settlers, they stopped their chanting. On all sides, I could hear hushed sounds of awe and compassion, Greer wrote. The buses then went to Ajo, where they were welcomed by children who burst out of the schoolrooms, waving both arms and shrilling at the tops of their voices. The buses moved south along a track next to the Dedessa River, a tributary of the Blue Nile. Hippos played in the water. The buses could not get through a steep gully with the creek at the bottom of it, and the stronger settlers spent half an hour lugging rocks to make a causeway, and the buses rolled over. And there's a roll of film that documents that. They then went on to Cone, where Greer photographed a beautiful tupul, which is a cone-shaped mud hut, with thatched roofs that a local man had built 
if you zoom into the digitized map that I showed earlier, you can see where she's gone. She's charted it all there. The convoy ended in a new settlement area around Gambella, a city south of Asosa on the eastern border of Ethiopia and Sudan. By the time I got to Gambella, after endless days and desperate appeals to various dignitaries to help me, I was seriously worried that I was, what I was going to see there would invalidate all the heroic effort I had witnessed in other settlement sites, she wrote. And um, this, is, yeah, this is a beautiful photograph of women selling mangoes. These photographs are making a political point. They were taken to counter the pornography of famine, Greer's phrase, and others, a genre of reporting that focused on the dead and the dying, preferably babies with grotesquely enlarged heads. Greer believed Bob Geldof's live aid event exemplified this approach, but it was what the public or the media who served them wanted. Quote, the, the public was hooked on it, she wrote, of the pornography of famine. You can't sell a picture of healthy, smiling Ethiopian for love or money, as I was to find out. But she did sell them, and many other things, in 2013, when this university bought the archive. This is another photo of women in the forest. The analog negatives have been developed as part of the Ethiopia project. The evidence of the politics of re reporting, especially working as a foreign correspondent. What do reporters see? What are they allowed to see? How can they understand what they are seeing when they don't speak the language? Many people have helped make the records you are seeing and hearing. Greer and the Ethiopians who cooperated with her, the photo processing lab, UDC, Prime Focus who digitised the cassettes, Kate Hodgetts who catalogued the audio, Lachlan and Sarah who catalogued the TV and major works Ethiopia records. The wealth of this university, the wealth of donors who raised money to buy the archive and Greer's fame are all part of the provenance of this material. Archives can be actors for social justice. Archives can be a force that insists on remembering. These negatives witness the Ethiopian famine. They force us to look at what is happening now in East Africa. We are now all helping to process the Ethiopian famine of 1985, adding our own versions of this catastrophe to the powerful words and pictures taken by Jermaine Greer. Thank you. Thank you very much to all, all four of you. It certainly sounds like a really fascinating collection. Um, so we've got um, a bit of time for questions. Um, we do have a microphone over here. Um, so if you'd like to uh, please say your name and organisation before you speak. So let's start over there. Hi, I'm Pixie. I'm from Flinders University. Okay. Um, I've got two questions. Um, the first one is... Uh, are there, do you think there are any negatives with working with a living donor? And um, what is next for the archives? So I haven't got a comparable experience of working with a dead donor. This is the first archive I've worked with in this way. Um, it, it's a very, very complex. Uh, um, it's, it's very complex because I think all the talks have touched on um, the fact that the archive is remembering things that Greer can't remember. How could you remember? She's nearly 80 now and her life has been really big life um, and also that um, I mean we, we've there's been such a team of us working on this archive that we've been able to gain a lot of control of it that really one person or one researcher could not have achieved it would take uh, Jermaine Greer said when uh, Christine Wallace was writing her biography of her in the 1990s you know she called her a, oh, her mud or some terrible uh, dung beetle uh, you know, the dung beetle working on the thing. And um, she said it would take five years of dedicated effort to read through my archive. But we, we've really, you know, that, that hiding place has been opened up by our work, I guess. Um, I feel that we've worked really hard as a group um, to, to, to respect the relationship with the living person who's created this extraordinary collection of records. And something that adds another level of complexity is Greer's um, ongoing celebrity. And, and her, her, she's one of the few old women that's still listened to, for good or for bad. And I do take my hat off to her for that. You know, she still gets invited to appear on national television shows, and um, there aren't many women of 79 uh, afforded that level of attention. D does someone else want to say something about that? No, I'm not going to say that there's somebody to pick up your typos. Oh, yeah, that's good. Yeah, someone to pick up your typos. Yep, that's good. Um, there are, I think there is sort of a tension of... Um, control. I think um, what I mentioned um, sort of towards the end um, about this idea of the ideal archive, um, when she was here in March, um, we were looking through the collections, um, you know, everything's been catalogued and, um, well, 
what we were looking at had been catalogued. And she, she was like, oh, this shouldn't be here. Like, this should be, we should move this over here. And, of course, that's, you know, anathema to us. So, <laughs> like, so, yeah, there's still, it's still very much living to her, I think, um, which is, isn't so much a negative, but it's attention, if that is a distinction. Um, in terms of what's next, um, Rachel mentioned the um, AV digitization. So we've got, um, it's kind of a companion piece to the documentation of the television series. Um, and so that will be sort of digitized by the end of the year and will be available for researchers in the value reading room. Um, a lot of, there's a lot of really interesting material in there in that, you know, a lot of it's material that was published or broadcast, but there's also a lot of rough cuts, fine cuts, raw footage uh, from some really interesting and really obscure programs, um, which will be great. Um, and the other thing we're sort of trying to grapple with and have been trying to grapple with for, you know, over a year is her born digital material. Um, and that's sort of a wider issue with uh, University of Melbourne Archives is developing a process, developing, um, implementing a platform that can actually control um, allow us to describe and provide access to those sort of materials. So, any other questions? Hi, yeah, my name's Simon Underschultz. I work at the National Gallery of Australia Library, and um, we've had the experience of archiving Mike Parr's um, documents and work, and he's a living donor, and we've recently actually gotten a second installment of his archive and he intends to add more to it. So I guess I just had a question around how, how did you determine your series and also is there a plan that you're going to receive more from Greer and does she use the archive as well? So Katrina Dean who's here in the audience is the university, was the former uni university archivist who took the Greer archive in and set up some of those arrangements so the archive um, New material was coming in each March, so Greer has retained um, control, ownership of recent working records. Uh, so I think it's material of five years or whatever it is. So like we got stuff from 2010, March this year. So new material, yeah, March last year, there was some material from Cave Creek, the rainforest that Greer owns in Queensland, uh, plus some material like Sarah talked about the books, but also some paper records. So 2010, speaking and TV, plus some sort of estrays, like things that, you know, early 1970s material. And then this year in March, um, there was some more paper records, uh, some born digital material, and some very interesting wedding photographs, the only wedding photographs of the three-week wedding that came to the archive via um, the man administering the estate of Derek Brooks, the guy who took the pictures. So they came in. Uh, so that's that answer to that question. So yes, there's that. Um, it's open. It's open. Isn't it? It's the archives continuum. So it's being developed. And with the series, um, when I started, there was uh, just one number for the whole archive. Uh, and um, but now we've listed 15 series. So Katrina Dean, um, we work. We work. Katrina sort of had identified some natural series. So there's the index cards. There's a correspondence series, which is 120 boxes and um, audio series f photos. They're quite simple. The series that I think are really the early year series, which was I catalogued when I started, that was a great place to start. I've never catalogued a collection before. I'm actually being sarcastic there, but um, it's a really complex collection of records that are quite chaotic, but I really love it because of that. I, I think it's where there hasn't been that same level of intervention, and that's where the records are about, the, the surviving paper records about the female eunuch, for example, and those Ethiopia negatives are in there, and I, I don't know if we've done the right thing or not. We've really tried... I re was really guided by what Katrina said, just trying to retain things. I'm really interested in what's side by side. I think there's a lot of value in that rather than sort of creating series of like records, like a diary series, for example. So we've really tried to stick with the received order of material, but keeping in mind that um, there's lots of evidence of Greer's intervention, certainly in the late 1990s as she was preparing the archive for sale. She was rearranging things really actively. And it's, it, you know, we've all found documents where at the top of it it'll say, make Ethiopia file, put in women's lib file, or all these instructions and crazy, you know, and it's just too big. I mean, it's 500 boxes. Have I answered? <laughs> Have I answered? Yeah. Um, Stephanie from the Museum of Contemporary Art in Sydney. I just um, was quite interested in your idea of ambient knowledge and how you might uh, capture that 
mm. or of your plans to capture that, yeah. particularly around all your experiences putting this archive together? Mm. Um, Yes, so one of the ways is a talk like this, so um, really self-consciously making an effort to really share what we know. I, I first started thinking of that term, I heard an interview on the radio about the ambient internet, you know, the internet was everywhere, and I, and I just started thinking about all the stuff we knew, and how much I used to even know last year, like about the early years series, for example, that I don't really know anymore. And, and I can't really capture that any, anywhere. So um, I, I've put a big emphasis in my job on, on public events, uh, you know, things like this. We've all done, everyone in the team's done, has done writing about the archive. Kate's made a really fantastic podcast. So we're doing some of that, it's sometimes called outreach, but I feel it's part of our, our duty really to, our ethical duty to share what we know. You just can't put everything in a finding aid. Um, and I, I've developed that idea in an essay that's going to be in Archive Area about the Iran album, which is an amazing photograph album documenting Greer's trip to Iran in 1974 with Betty Friedan. The Shah's twin sister invited them, and they were planning the International Year of Women. And um, that, that the ambient knowledge contained within this team has allowed me to get a lot of new information and create really good... So uh, metadata is a big way. I think you can put a lot of knowledge into metadata. And also, you can't... Um, backtrack because we just don't have the time to so like with the audio series a lot of the radio things I found out a lot of contextual information later on in the radio series but I can't go back and add those to the finding aids because it would just take too long so we've created in the finding aids um, consistent keywords so they should cross over and link researchers to both records um, yeah, other than that, it's yeah, just outreach, publications and stuff like that as much as we can really while we're here. And even some of the knowledge, I mean, the, the thing about it is, as everyone would know, some of it's secret knowledge. I mean, some of it's knowledge, like, for example, acquisitions folder, for example, behaviour conversations with Jermaine Greer that are confidential. I mean, I've been very aware of that, but I still know these things, so it shapes knowledge of closed records. I mean... That, that sort of, I've really had to think a lot about the power, archival power and how it operates and how you can bestow favours on researchers or not. W one of the interesting things for me is I was a historian and I am surprised and shocked actually at the ongoing level of naivety in general uh, that perhaps many researchers have about the level of knowledge as archivists have. Uh, and it's unfortunate. Um, I don't know what the answer is to that. Mm. I mean, of course we have a lot of knowledge. We've spent months working intensively like Lachlan the knowledge Lachlan had about those letters at the time well no one else will have that knowledge that's that's it Sorry. Um, do, you, do you think that's partly naivety or um, sort of people's fear that if they haven't created the knowledge themselves that they're not going to be regarded as the, the of value or something so so yeah just in in light of bringing to light your ambient knowledge would, I mean, the, the approach that seems to me to make sense is collaborative, you know, that, that historians would work with archivists such as yourselves to make that knowledge more and more accessible and, and disseminate it more. But perhaps, perhaps, it's, perhaps it's a culture of professionalism or something that makes people think, oh, well, you already know it, but I want to know it, so I want to pretend you don't know it or something weird like that. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not, I don't know. I, I, I think, I think we're, yeah, like we're, we're really, yeah, that's right. I think we're, we're doing everything we can. Um, and, and um, I mean, what, what's our knowing for? Like, what's our finding aids for, really, in the end? I mean, who, I've thought, what, who are we finding, what are we creating these documents for? And in many ways, we're creating them for each other and for all of you. We're creating them for the people that will be working in, in the archive once on dead. I, I, I mean, we're trying to. We, I, I think we are trying to do that. Are we trying to do that? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. And then you think about, like, with, so with um, Lachlan's, the subject headings choosing for the letters save, I mean, we have all made strategic decisions about things that we are and aren't going to h highlight, and I'm sure every archivist has done that. Um, that's true. I think it's certainly part of the, um, part of the issue. I Another part of the issue is that I think as a profession we tend to be quite self-effacing because um, I think there's a perception that we should allow the records to speak for themselves, um, of course. And so that means um, trying to stand 
as little between the researchers and the archive as possible. Now, that's, to a certain extent, I think it's sort of a, a false dichotomy because we are constantly intervening in the, in the records themselves. Our traces are entirely through the archives, both physically and in terms of the intellectual work we've done in describing. Um, yeah, that's what's all about. A sentiment analysis on the metadata I created for the print journalism series. So sentiment analysis software is normally used to analyse tweets and social media responses. And so she applied it. It measures positive and negative emotion. And she ran it over the 50,000 word uh, finding aid I've made for the print journalism series. And that work is really very, very exciting what she's found. So that I was a bit sceptical and I just thought let the computer whiz kid do it. But then I ha was really humbled by what, what, her, what that process had revealed. So it revealed the most ambivalent listing in the series is the one for Greer's column about the murder of James Bulger. So t eight year old boys murdered a two year old boy. And the column was incredibly challenging in its content, very sophisticated and very ambivalent. And so the column scored the highest negative rating, my, my, my listing and the highest positive rating for emotion. Um, so, you know, she's, it's, she's identifying how much my personal responses to the material, but how affecting Greer's own journalism is. Uh, so I guess that's another way, that kind of exciting way of looking at our metadata and acknowledging that that's another record that's been created that can be interrogated, however. Yes, um, this reflects on these questions when you're dealing with people like Greer, um, that it's very much focused on Greer. But what I'm thinking about is these people, are the descendants of these people in these photographs from Ethiopia going to be able to see these photographs? Yep. Yeah, so, um, yep, just published them yesterday and haven't yet got on to reaching out to Ethiopian Australian communities here in Melbourne, but I'm going to do it. Um, so I've done that work with the Iran album. I use social media to find, um, identify uh, one of the hosts of the trip and I sent a digital surrogate of the album and she's been able to identify every Iranian person in those images. Plus I found a photographer that took one of the images and so... I've started that. This is a much bigger project. So um, um, I think these photographs will have a high interest uh, to Ethiopian people. Um, they are now available to everyone anywhere in the world, including in Ethiopia, if they type the word Ethiopia into the finding aid. And I'm very aware of the ethical issues involved. Um, but I feel that they have a really high value and they deserve to be out there. And let's see what I, what I can do in the time. I agree. So... I'm just, that's exactly right. I've done all the work to create these objects and now it's time to start seeing if I can join up the dots. So thanks, it's good, yep, I agree. And that, that those stories can then be added to the metadata, which is what I've done with the Iran album. Uh, we've been able to, you know, it's very detailed listing now of all the places that are being visited there and uh, I'm working with a young woman a librarian from Tehran who's doing a PhD at Monash University and she's going to, is working on translating my article into Farsi to talk about, to share that work in Iran.